everybody. I'm Derek McGinty, and welcome to the D.C. office of the Tenant Advocates' brand new webinar series, OTA from A to Z. If you rent your home in Washington, D.C., you already know the laws can get complicated. Your landlord may or may not have your best interest at heart, and sometimes things just can go wrong. But whatever happens, the OTA has got your back. And that is why we begin our webinar series with OTA 101, and our guest is Joanna Shreve. She is OTA's chief tenant advocate. She's going to shed some light on OTA's role and how it can help you if you've got challenges with your landlord, maybe facing eviction, or just having problems with mold or pests. Joanna Shreve's been dealing with issues around affordable housing for more than two decades. She is actually the brains and the spirit behind the creation of OTA. That's why we're so glad to chat with her today. Welcome, Joanna. Thank you very much, Good Derek. to chat Thank with you. Thank you very much. Well, first, first things first, what makes you so passionate about tenants' rights? I believe that everyone that rents a unit has the right to decent, safe, and sanitary housing. And the findings that uh, were uh, created by uh, former council member Jim Graham made it clear that tenants in the District of Columbia were not getting their fair share. Mm. They were not getting their fair shot, that they also were not really aware of what their rights were. And because I'd been in the housing industry, as you said, for the last couple of decades, I knew how important it was to be able to uh, stand in for those tenants, to be the voice in government which is a unique role that you don't find any place in the United States. And it's interesting to me that you say D.C. tenants were not getting a fair shake or getting a, their fair share, when D.C. for decades has had the, some of the strongest rent control protections the, of any city in the country. What was going wrong? Oh, many, many things were going wrong. Um, tenants were being taken advantage of because they didn't know their rights. Uh, tenants were not being able to articulate their concerns in a in a fashion that allowed the city council to really uh, understand how much pain they were in. Mm. So things are better now from your perspective? Well, yes, they are better. Uh, they know that we're here. Uh, we have people walking into our doors every day. Uh, last year, as an example, we saw over 8,000 tenants uh, that just walked in. Uh, tenants can also contact us through our website. Right. And they do that from all over the world. Really? Indeed. Even though you can't help them all over the Even world. Even though we cannot help them, we can find uh, the right place to direct them to. But yes, tenants uh, across this country uh, have long, long had problems with landlords. Right. Now, in, 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 in dealing with that, you've created the Tenant Bill of Rights here in Washington, D.C., and that was a huge achievement for your agency. What are those rights that every tenant has? Well, there are 14 explicit rights that are with, entailed within the Bill of Rights. The right to a lease, uh, the right to receive a receipt when you rent, hmm. uh, the right to have the landlord disclose to you any conditions, petitions uh, that may have been filed against that property, the right to a fair eviction, which you which you um, uh, know that in this city there are 10 reasons for evictions. Uh, the tenant has a broad range of rights that we, the security deposit is one of probably the most um, uh, known ones in the city because we require that the tenant receive from the landlord notification uh, if, in fact, he feels that there's a violation at the end of the lease sure, period. Sure, sure. And the security deposit's a subject all into itself. We're going to actually do a webinar on that down the road at some Absolutely. point just to talk about that issue. But, but I'm curious about um, the fact that D.C. has tried to come a long way. What have you seen uh, in terms of the market changing, say, in the last 10 years? How is it different? How is it worse? How is it better for tenants? Well, clearly, uh, based upon whoever the executive was, the city has a very, very aggressive agenda for continuing to build housing in the district. And unfortunately, you know, the cost of construction precludes many tenants from being able to afford the rents once the project has been closed on and received their certificate of occupancy. Um, the affordable aspect of housing, along with the tax credits, the low-income housing tax credit and other vehicles, the National Housing Trust Fund, there are vehicles that allow for the creation and the construction of, of affordable housing, but they do take a longer period of time. Mm. 
um, the incomes of individuals that live in the city has changed. We have a great number of people who are making more money, so therefore rents can be charged at a higher rate. Um, the public housing stock has dwindled since 1985. That's, that's a good point. Now, who would you blame for that? Is it the city's fault, the federal government? What happened? Well, it appears that there were decisions made to take some of the public housing stock out of the public housing inventory, and that was an unfortunate decision. Um, typically, I think the waiting list for district uh, government uh, tenants looking for affordable housing is somewhere close to 40,000 people. Wow. And to date, we have approximately 8,256 units. So with that demand uh, and the growing, man the, the growing of family compositions, uh, a lot of children or a lot of young people are having more children. And so having larger units is a challenge for the city. Mm -hmm. Building those, where do you have the land to build larger apartment complexes? Uh, being able to convert what we've tried to say in many instances is that you have schools that are not being used, why not convert them mm -hmm. into affordable housing? Is, is affordability the number one problem for renters in D.C. right now? It's one of the highest priorities, yes. And we have a growing number of elderly. And because the elderly have contributed to the growth of the city, I think it's important for the city to give back. Well, speaking of seniors, there was a fire back in September of 2018 at the Arthur Capper Senior Apartments. 200 people displaced. OTA got deeply involved in trying to deal with that. Talk about what you did. Well, let's talk about what we do. Uh, the Office of the Tenant Advocate is the only office in this United States that provides a, uh, what I would call an umbrella a protection program for tenants when they find themselves temporarily displaced. Uh, the Red Cross used to provide three days of housing. Now they've changed that to providing a money card, mm -hmm. which means that the tenants can use that money card for any reason. So we have become technically a first responder in that if they don't use their card to find a hotel or uh, some sort of housing, uh, they can call us up and we will put them into a hotel for 14 days. Wow. Uh, we will provide, if they have any belongings, 60 days of storage. Uh, we will provide on a limited basis, in some instances, first times rent and security deposits. Um, we have worked with, I can't tell you how many tenants over the course of the last 10 years uh, who have found themselves in this position. In the case of the Arthur Capper fire, as an example, the 162 tenants that lived there uh, were all elderly. Right, because it was a senior apartment. It was apartment. a senior property that was once public housing. Wow. And that particular property, we housed the tenants within 24 hours. Uh, they were in a variety of hotels across the city because that's when we began to find out that the inventory for handicap units was very, very limited in the hotel inventory. Uh, those individuals were in hotels from September the 18th of 2018 till approximately January of 2019. And where'd they go after that? Many of them were, well, all of them were placed in new facilities, new housing. Uh, some left the area, moved to North Carolina and other places. Some needed what you would call nursing home level housing. Right. And so they were found, they, a place was found for them. Uh, the cost ranged around $2.7 million. Yeah. So do you have enough resources to meet the need? I mean, that's a great story. And fortunately, people aren't burned out of their homes every other week uh, because if it happened more often, obviously it'd be t totally tragic. But uh, do, when you look at the need and you look at your resources, how close are you to meeting it? Well, on an, on an average year, we are pretty much able to meet the needs of those who find themselves in these temporary displacement e environments. Uh, fortunately, in this particular instance with the Arthur Capper property, the mayor was very gracious. She provided an additional $3.8 million to the Office of the Tenant Advocate. So we were able to handle that particular situation because we had used our entire allocation by October, wow. which was $550,000, uh, which is about the normal amount that we receive on the average a year. Um, doing a trend, we've, we've found that the average 
uh, amount used for emergency housing runs between four hundred fifty and five hundred thousand a year. I understand. So, can you point to some other success stories for us? Oh, sure. Uh, our, we have a legal division that gets involved with representation, uh, both on uh, litigation side, but also on the settlement side. And in many instances, we have been very successful in assisting tenants in settlement agreements. Um, we do an, a, re, a report to the city council every year, and normally we are giving back somewhere between two and three million dollars a year to the tenant community. Wow. Um, that happens because at one point we had a, a legal service partner program, so we were dealing with other nonprofit legal entities that were working with us on specific areas of the law. Uh, one in particular handled nothing but senior issues. Another handled nothing but subsidized housing issues. But we were able to ensure that tenants, at, 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 no matter where you live and how you paid your rent, we were there to help meet those needs. Sure. You mentioned, and we talked a little bit about how the city has changed demographically as, as, as well as uh, income-wise, all of this. Have the requests c coming to you, therefore, changed? Did the problems change because the city has changed? Well, actually, no. The problems for, for most renters is pretty much the same, and, and it starts with the fact that they don't read the lease. <laughs> In most instances. That's an important document, and most yes. folks have not read it. Well, and it's not only an important document. I think what we want the public to understand, it is a legal contract mm -hmm. between you and that landlord. He is responsible for meeting his obligations that are set forth in the provisions of the lease, and you, the tenant, also have responsibilities to meet your part of the bargain. Sure. When that doesn't happen, then conflict can arise. I'm curious, you mentioned the fact that people come in and call from all around the city and all around the world, literally. Mm -hmm. What are some of the most common questions you get? The most common set of questions comes from security deposits. Really? Yes, because a lot of housing providers find creative ways to try to keep the money. And um, again, when the tenants don't read the lease, um, you know, in one instance we had a situation where some young men who were going to college and I, ha I didn't mention that in addition to uh, the everyday Joe who was working every day and has a family, we also represent the interests of students, mm. those who live in embassies, uh, because they're here for only a short period of time. And so, have you had a problem with people who are in embassies? Has there been an issue that there you had have to deal been, with? Oh, yes. I mean, we've had individuals who work for the International Monetary Fund who have paid money to uh, uh, what you would say a Craigslist advertisement. Oh. And we've walked sometimes to the exact location of where this, this housing is supposed to be. And we've found soccer fields. Wow. Uh, so, so somebody's taking advantage of the so fact these folks don't is, know the area. Exactly. So fraud occurs. Um, we think it's important that students uh, are educated in the understanding of what it means to rent because once they pass that sophomore year and they can live off campus, they're dying to get into somebody's basement or somebody's sure. house. Everybody wants to get out of home, don't want to live at home with mom and That's dad anymore, exactly and they want to have their right. own place. But mom and dad are usually still paying for it. So what's important is for the student to understand not only what his obligations are, but more importantly, what are the obligations of the landlord. Because in so many instances, we find young people will rent sight unseen. They move and they come to the city, and then what they face is a horrendous, dilapidated, roach-infested, sometimes rat-infested property. Um, so we're trying to So what to are you doing them. in a case like that? Well, in that case, uh, sometimes they're um, unfortunately out of luck. Oh, that is unfortunate. Sometimes they're fortunately out of luck and they have to find another place to live. All right, Ms. Shreve, we're going to put you on the spot. We're going to take a shot at some questions from your Ask the Director hotline. I hope that's okay. Sure. Are you ready? Okay, let's Absolutely. go to question number one. My lease expires at the end of the month. My landlord wants me to leave. Do I have to leave the apartment? The answer is no, you don't have to leave. What happens at the end Once of the month? Once you sign a lease in the District of Columbia, you literally can stay there for a long time unless you don't pay the rent. As long as you have 
ensure that you are uh, meeting all of the obligations that are defined in the lease, uh, you have the ability to live on. Unless, of course, the landlord files a notice with you that he's going to need the unit back for personal use. And in that instance, he gives you a notification, uh, which is a 90-day notice to vacate. Um, there are some reasons why you may have to leave a unit, but normally you have the right to remain. So the end of the lease is not one of those reasons usually. That is correct. And if he doesn't want to renew for any length of time, you just go month to month. That is correct also. All right. Let's get to question number two. Two months ago, I vacated my apartment and the landlord did not return my $2,000 security deposit. What should I do? Well, you've already screamed. <laughs> because you didn't get your money back, but what you need to do is to provide the landlord with a letter of demand for your money first, so that you've officially written him, informing him that you are expecting the return of your security deposit. If he fails to respond to that letter of demand, you have the right to file in small claims court. Uh, the filing fee, I believe, is $15. Uh, you file, uh, and a hearing date is set. Uh, to hear your, your case. Mm. Um, a lot of times, as I indicated, the landlord tries many creative ways to keep the tenant's money. Sure. So many, many tenants call us on a regular basis about receiving their money. The law says that there's a total of 75 days that are, uh, uh, are involved in the lease return. The first 30 days, the, the, the landlord has the right and the responsibility to inspect the unit to make sure that there is nothing that happened to it. If at the end of the 30 days nothing has happened, he should be returning your security deposit. Under what circumstances legally can a landlord hold on to your money? The landlord can hold on to your money if, as an example, you have violated, let's say, the provision of the lease that indicates that you must get permission before you do any alterations to the unit. A lot of times people want to paint the unit a color, mm. but they didn't ask the landlord for permission. So the landlord can then indicate to you on the move out, that's a dinging on the move out inspection, and it's going to cost you to replace the unit to the, the color that it was when you moved in. If you uh, affix pictures to the wall and you leave large holes in the wall that are not repaired, the landlord can charge you for that. So this comes down to damage, really, is what you're talking about. It comes down to certain damages, but we see also occasionally where landlords try to stick the tenant with cleaning fees mm. or repainting of the unit. Not legal? Not legal, because there's something called normal wear and tear, and the landlord absorbs that on a move out. He has an operating expense to address that on a move out. And most landlords have in their budget a certain amount or a certain percentage of vacancy turnover. So it's a normal cost of business for them, which they can write off on their taxes. There you go. All right, let's talk about question number three here. Here's our last question. I am trying to create a tenant association for my property, having difficulty getting interest and commitment from my neighbors. Do you have any tips on how to increase participation from my neighbors to create a sustainable tenant association? Tenant associations usually are formed when something's wrong, mm. not when something is going right. Uh, so my recommendations to that particular inquiry would be to contact Steve Dudek of our office. Steve assists in helping you to form a tenant association. Uh, he will provide you with the guidance that you need to understand what the rules of engagement are in the city, what the filing fee for a tenant association are, and more importantly, what are the benefits in creating a tenant association? Tenant associations can come together to, as an example, form their own renter's insurance group. Tenant associations could come together to be able to have a uh, dialogue with management. You know, crowd, the, the, the larger the crowd, the more impact you have. Singularly, you get very, very little reaction from your landlord. But mm. when a group of tenants come together and say, we need to talk to you, usually a landlord is willing to listen. Speaking of getting groups of tenants together, I understand you're going to have a ten tenant summit very soon. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what that entails and what you hope to get out of it. Well, we have had a tenant summit for the past decade. 
And as a part of our Establishment Act, one of the program areas that we are required to do is education. So every September, we meet with the tenant community to discuss issues of importance to them. We talk about the federal appropriations. We talk about changes in public housing. We talk about changes as it relates to the city council and new laws that may have been put in place. We hold workshops on specific issues that are directly uh, informing the tenant of their rights in certain areas. We hold uh, meetings on uh, associations and how they can maintain sustainability. So we'll be talking about that. Uh, several weeks ago, I was in New York with a group of experts uh, to talk about the consideration of the third generation of rent control because rent, rent control and rent stabilization is now a national discussion. Uh, New York just passed some very, very progressive laws that uh, the people there were very, very excited about. And we are looking at how we can continue to provide uh, the citizens of the city with an ability to have rents that are controlled. All right, well, I know you'll be doing your very, very best. We try. And that annual tenant summit sounds like a really productive use of a Saturday afternoon. Absolutely. All right, thank Absolutely. you so much. Well, we have come to the end of our first webinar. I'd like to thank Joanna Shreve for kicking off OTA from A to Z. And by the way, it'll be available on our website, ota.dc.gov. We hope you have learned a few interesting things about the organization and will join us for the next part in our series. If you've got questions, contact the OTA. Again, the webinar is available online at ota.dc.gov by phone, 202-719-6560, Monday through Friday, 8.45 a.m. to 4.45 p.m., or just drop in. Stop by 2014th Street Northwest, Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Again, this has been OTA from A to Z. I'm Derek McGinty. We'll see you next time.